I'll start over. <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome you all here. My name is Batya Friedman. I'm a faculty member in the Information School and a co-director for the Tech Policy Lab here at UW. And i um, really pleased that you're all here to join us tonight for the first distinguished lecture um, from the Tech Policy Lab that you and Vandenhoven will be giving shortly. Um, let me first tell you a little bit about um, UW's Tech Policy Lab and then a little bit about Yeroon. So the Tech Policy Lab um, was launched in September 2013. It's just a little over a year old, um, founded with a generous um, gift from Microsoft. And the work of the lab is to strengthen and inform technology policy through research, education, and thought leadership. Our goals are twofold. We want to bridge the gap between rapidly emerging technologies and the policies that historically lag behind. We want to understand why those tech policies that often come into place fall short. And we want to foster conversation between technologists and policymakers to help improve that process going forward. The lab brings together experts from across the University of Washington, from the School of Law, from the Information School, from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering and other units on campus. Um, in addition to myself, the co-directors are Ryan Callow from the Law School, who sits on advisory boards for EPIC and EFF and the Future of Privacy Forum, and Tadayoshi Kono, who's in Computer Science and Engineering and is a leader in developing new security technologies, so for self-driving cars, embedded medical devices, and the like. Uh, the lab is launching a number of um, key projects, one of which is with um, Seattle City. So for those of you who live in Seattle, you'll be interested to hear about um, things having to do with open data. The data that the city has about the activities of the people who move in and out of the city and what the parameters are for making that data accessible to people online. Um, we're looking at how to integrate tech policy into undergraduate STEM education, and um, Professor Dave Hendry in the audience is leading that effort. We've been looking at augmented reality, um, ways in which technical and legal aspects come together in how new technologies like Google Glass should be regulated and in what ways. So one of the things that the Tech Policy Lab is doing is trying to bring some of the issues and questions around tech policy to the public at large. And our Distinguished Lecture Series is one of our leading efforts in that regard. And this is our very first Distinguished Lecture. So the goal here is to bring together interdisciplinary groups, the public, to engage with conversations around hard questions about what sort of society we want to live in and what roles we want technology to play and what kinds of policies and regulations should perhaps be put in place. So the lecture tonight is one part of that distinguished lecture series, and Yeroon has engaged also in a series of meetings with faculty and students on campus, and will continue to do so throughout the week. So now let me tell you a little bit about um, our lecture tonight, our presenter. Um, Jeroen Vandenhoven is a professor of ethics and technology at Delft University of Technology. He's the first scientific director for 3TU Ethics, which is a three-campus consortium around ethics in the Netherlands. He's currently editor-in-chief of Ethics and Information Technology, has published numerous, numerous articles and books on ethics and ICT, technology, design, and values, including most recently the design turn in applied ethics, by Cambridge University Press. In 2009, Yeroon won both the World Technology Award for Ethics and the IFIP Prize for ICT and Society for his work on ethics and ICT. He's chair of the program committee of the Dutch Research Council on Responsible Innovation and recently advised the European Commission on Responsible Innovation and its role in the new EU R&D program, Horizon 2020. I first came to know Yeroon oh, about a decade or more ago, um, around issues about how to bring values into the design of technology. Um, Yeroen immediately impressed me because he both, as a, a philosopher, understood um, how to talk about these values and he also understood the importance of the design turn for new technologies. He took um, our conversations and the kinds of work that has been going on here at UW and at his home institution, at Delft University and then at other institu institutions in the Netherlands, started to build a program that has taken the shape of responsible innovation. 
And that framing has then, um, through Yarun's leadership, become part of the EU agenda for how science and technical innovation in the EU goes forward. So very impressive to take these ideas, not only as research ideas, not only as academic philosophical ideas, but actually to change society and to change scientific practice. And so please join me in welcoming Jeroen here. We're very excited to hear him and hear his ideas about responsible innovation and robotics in particular. <laughs> Thank you, um, Bacha. It's, um, it's a great honor and a privilege to, uh, to be here and uh, to deliver this first uh, lecture of the Tech Policy Lab. Um, and uh, indeed, it's a, it's, a, it's a great honor because we go uh, uh, way back, um, 10 years as you, as you, as you said. Um, and when we met first time, I immediately recognized the, the potential of this concept of value-sensitive design not only to, um, to talk to um, you know, the engineers and the designers, but also to explain to moral philosophers and to ethicists how they should uh, kind of reach out to the world of technology and uh, how they should change and adjust their frameworks, their traditional philosophical conceptions. And that's exactly what I will try to um, explain to you uh, tonight, um, how this is a kind of a hinge between ethics, traditional ethical thinking, and how that can be used to jump to, you know, um, um, autonomous cars, robots, drones, modern uh, um, technology, um, and um, how uh, that concept of value-sensitive design, which is developed here at, uh, at UDEP, um, is a perfect marriage uh, with this concept that comes from Europe, responsible innovation. And I will give you uh, a story about what that exactly means. Uh, many of my colleagues in Europe are still struggling. They know that there is a large pot of money on the table in Brussels, but they, uh, they still have some difficulty of, uh, of uh, giving a, a, a definition or an account of it. Now first, I would like to tell you something about um, ethics in a world of design, and I will do that in three little chunks. Talk about trolleys, and I'll explain in a minute what these are, um, choice architectures and wideware engineering. Now you may, may have seen this, and um, so every philosophy 101 class starts with uh, trolley problems. Uh, so there's a choice, uh, there's a trolley coming down, you're at the switch, you can, if you do nothing, it will hit those five people, unfortunate, who are tied down to the track. You can switch the lever and then it hits that one person. I'll come back to that. Uh, if you want to do a PhD in, um, in, in trolleyology, you can, um, uh, assuming that you can add a little bit of new information or some new points of view to it. These are the grand old ladies of trolleyology, Philippa Food, uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson, and Francis Cam. The literature is vast and it's growing very rapidly. It's, it's, it's huge. If you go online, you, you will be able to find all kinds of popular books that give you detailed analysis of, uh, of this, uh, this thought experiment. And philosophers refer to it as an you know, intuition pump. Um, it teases out all kinds of fundamental moral ideas that we have and um, uh, turns them into problems. Now, um, so this is the trolley problem, and philosophers really get enthusiastic about it. They get carried away. Uh, they talk about Kantian uh, solutions and, and utilitarian and they have very, uh, various versions of it. There is even a version with a fat man. You can push a fat man onto the track to stop the train instead of the, uh, switching the lever. That is, uh, yeah, you, people start to laugh immediately because this is, they take serious, they start to do their calculations and they say, okay, of course it's, it's morally permitted, um, perhaps not morally uh, obligatory, but it's morally permitted to switch the lever, but pushing someone onto the track is, a, is a quite a different story. And actually, they have done some brain experiments, put people into fMRI scans to see what uh, could account for that different reaction. The one is the calculation, a more rational approach towards the other, more intuitive uh, 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 approach to the problem. And yes, indeed, uh, this, uh, this story, uh, this little narrative is associated with, uh, you know, the use of the more, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the neocortex. The other one is, is uh, 
is associated with the activity in our lizard brain. It's kind of a gut feel reaction. Uh, this is preposterous. You can't do that. Now, um, I'm trying to draw your attention to something which is, uh, which is missing in all of that literature in, ph in philosophy. And I, I think it's important for understanding the world of today, of the 21st century, the world of technology. And all of the theories that philosophers develop are based on a one-sided diet of cases. These types of cases where they abstract from one important dimension, uh, which I think is crucial for understanding and helping ourselves to conceptions of responsibility that are uh, adequate for the 21st century. And it's the following thing. If you explain this, as I've done at a technical university and discuss with students with a technical background this story, then their first reaction is, that's a bad design. It's a stupid piece of infrastructure. I would have designed that differently. And then, of course, don't try this in a philosophy seminar uh, because then you will be taken outside, you will be ridiculed, your reputation will be gone because you're not supposed to do this. Right. But if you, th because it's a thought experiment and you, you're not allowed to tamper with the, um, with the assumptions that go into the, the thought experiment. Um, but if you think about it, this is what engineers do for a living and this is do what they do, they take courses on this, is track design. It's the design of railway systems in order to improve railroad safety. And um, so that is very useful. That is very useful. And of course, that is exactly what we need. Uh, and um, uh, if you look at, at this particular case, the poor guy at the switch, you may say it's a little bit unfair because he's framed in this little piece of infrastructure and he has been given only two options to choose from, but he would have probably liked to have another option. As the engineers would point out, I would um, design in an early warning system where it signals that people are tied to the track. Or I would turn the lever into a brake that stops the trolley before it hits the junction. They come up with all kinds of clever solutions that would have prevented this poor guy from being in this tragic choice situation in the first place. So, um, and that is very useful. And they, s engineers, take that as a very serious uh, way of, of going about their business. And so this, this is what they would do. So uh, design in ethical theory is a result of this focus on, on these kind of artificial thought experiments um, design histories, design agents, design requirements are under-theorized. We tend to forget that this poor guy is in this particular situation because designers have designed that situation then for him to, to be in. And if you look at medical ethics, for example, you have thought experiments where the doctor is, suppose the doctor is at the bedside of a patient and he can do A or B. Well, if you've ever been to a, an, an operating theater in a modern, modern hospital, that is a very, that's a very high-tech environment. All of these options have been designed in, or certain options have been designed out. The, the, his responsibility or the dilemma that he faces is a result of a design history and people who have taken certain design decisions in the past. Now, uh, to be fair to uh, one of those uh, grand old ladies of trolleyology, Francis Camp from Harvard, in this book, Intricate Ethics, and intricate indeed it is, it's a very elaborate and very detailed study of these trolley cases and similar cases. And she says, uh, in a case uh, discusses in Jim and the Indians, this is another one of those wonderful stories that philosophers feast on, it's, uh, you're, you're wondering, you're in the rainforest, you're wandering into a village, and there you find a Spanish-speaking captain. He's about to, to execute a number of Indians, and he walks up to you, and, you, and he offers you a choice. You either pick one of the Indians to be executed, and he will spare the lives of the others, or if you refuse that, he will execute them all. So again, we're going to think about what is the responsibility of Jim? What is his obligation? And then Francis Cam says, the captain, not Jim, originates the threat to the Indians and makes the offer. Jim's threat is reactive to the captain's offer. 
it is its background acts of the captain rather than his subsequent, his, Jim's, subsequent intervening act that are most important for determining moral responsibility. It is unfair to, to Jim to say, well, you know, what, what's your responsibility? Of course, we can talk about it, but we have to bear in mind that he is in this situation because of this perverse offer that the captain has made to him. And of course, the reductio ad absurdum, or the extreme, is the story that you perhaps know, is Sophie's Choice, the book and the film uh, about uh, a woman with two children at the mercy of a perverse Nazi officer that, who offers her a choice between picking one of her children to be sent off to the gas chamber, uh, and if she refuses to do so, both of them will be sent to the gas chamber. Right? And then philosophers would say, what is the responsibility, what is the moral obligation of Sophie to, well, stop, let's stop here, because it's her situation is a very tragic and dramatic one, and it, it, uh, we have to bear in mind that it is the, the choice architect, as we will see in a minute, that is responsible in the first place, and he should have done uh, something else. So there are some people who are making some some, um, some very useful suggestions along these lines and draw our attention to the fact that there are design histories that we have to take into account if we want to talk and discuss the responsibility for high-tech environments and systems that we're using and pieces of infrastructure. We, uh, we usually refer to them as socio-technical systems, ensembles of devices, software, people running around, protocols, govern, um, uh, governance regimes, and, and regulation. Cass Sunstein, a former advisor to, um, uh, to President Obama and professor of, um, I think it's public policy and economics at, at, at Chicago, wrote this book, famous book, Nudge. Um, and he introduces the term, the term choice architecture there. A nudge is an aspect of a choice architecture, <laughs> a, um, a number, a menu of options that you can choose from uh, that alters behavior in a predictable way without forbidding any options. They're very proud of this, this the, the thing that they thought of. You know, you, you don't tamper with the freedom and liberty of people, but you just make suggestions to them. Uh, and so it makes certain types of behavior more likely uh, to happen. So, for example, the arranging of food in the canteen, in your canteen in the, in, in the university, you put the deep fried stuff, which is supposed to be unhealthy, in the back and the healthy tomatoes and lettuce in, in the front, so you make it more likely that people reach for them and not for the unhealthy deep fried stuff. And a choice architect has the responsibility for organizing the context in which people make those decisions. You see, we're getting closer to the point that I, I, I would like to make, uh, albeit through a different body of literature, namely the nudge literature. Um, so this is an example of, uh, of what he has in mind. So we have all kinds of interesting devices that nudge people to slow down. You can drive if you want. You can drive with you know, 100 miles an hour, but if you've done once, you'll uh, forget. This is also a piece of Dutch design. Uh, you can, um, you can um, all the degrees of freedom, so to speak, are there, but you're, you're kindly invited to aim for the, uh, the fly. Uh, so it... Uh, so our lives are full with these choice architectures, you know, options uh, to choose from, and they're arranged by people who have really worked hard, studied hard, thought about these, but they're presented to you uh, as, as, as uh, a series of, um, of, of things to choose from. Um, another way of making the same point, namely that our high-tech environment is... Um, is, represents a number of choices that others have, have thought, of, uh, thought about for us on our behalf, is the literature on uh, philosophy of mind by Andy Clark and Chalmers. And they talk about extended minds. And their idea is, why would my mind stop at the boundary of my skull? Right? Why wouldn't my mind protrude or extend into the, into the outside world? And they talk about wideware engineering. Right? So, designing a lab or designing a high-tech environment with computers and laptops and, and books and, and, uh, and things to, um, and calculators is, is a matter of why we're engineering. And they say, if, as we confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process which, were it done in the head, 
we would have no hesitation in recognizing as part of the cognitive process, then that part of the world, so we claim, is part of that cognitive process. Cognitive processes aren't, ain't all in the head, right? So they, they extend into the outside world and they're part of my mind. Well, I'm not so much interested in the philosophical, ontological, metaphysical claim, so it's not the metaphysical interpretation, but I would like to draw attention to the moral importance of this uh, kind of picture they're conjuring up. Why we're engineering, and they give the example of Otto the Alzheimer patient. Otto the Alzheimer patient, if you do a brain scan, his brains are gone. It's, it's terrible, it's a, it's a very um, advanced stage of, of Alzheimer. So you would expect if you would visit Otto, uh, he wouldn't be able to live um, by himself in his apartment. But if you visit him, he seems to be able to get around quite well. You know? But if you look closer, uh, you notice that he has designed his environment, redesigned his environment in such a way that he can find his way. There's all kinds of sticky notes, books left open, little arrows to point to draw his attention. He has redesigned his environment in such a way that he can carry on living by himself uh, with, uh, with some occasional assistance. Um, now, suppose someone would sneak into Otto's apartment and he would change all the kind of sticky notes and change all the arrows and, and so make a miss, mess of, of that carefully designed environment, then that would be appalling. That would be morally very a wrong thing to do, and it would be on a par with tempering with someone's brain. You can, you can see that because that is his, as they claim, his extended brain. That, that's the thing, the slightly improved, enhanced device, because the part, the physical part is gone, that he has actually created a system that helps him to them. So, both the choice architecture and the wide we're engineering and the trolley case point in the same direction that the design and the design agents, the people who bear responsibility for designing those environments where people have certain responsibilities and will function um, in the performance of certain tasks and will have certain duties and obligations to carry out is a very important thing. So that is a point that I wanted to make. Agents are framed, subsumed in choice architectures, wideware environments, or socio-technical systems and smart infrastructures. And we will see towards the end some of the examples in the drone automated, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles and um, smart uh, systems. So the user or the operator, is, his or her responsibility is a function of the design of the environment he is in. And this, of course, applies to all of these uh, highly complex and dynamic situations which are carry, uh, contain an incredible amount of design decisions. And what people can do, the operators, all the people who bear responsibilities, often with very high stakes, are in a certain sense at the mercy of the people who have designed this uh, uh, way back. Finance, healthcare, the army, industry, public safety. And this draws attention to the ideas that have been developed here about if we want to proceed in an ethical and morally responsible way, um, given the importance of those de designed environments, we have to think about how we can make our ethical principles, our ideas bear upon these high-tech environments because it will have great consequences for the people who will assume responsibilities and will have to function as agents and moral persons in those environments. So how do we do that? How do we make those principles and moral ideals bear upon? Uh, already in, in the 70s, in the uh, end of the 60s, what Joe Weizenbaum in his book, Computer Power and Human Reason, said that designers need to have the most profound awareness that their products are a result of human choices, and they have to take responsibility for that. Now, this is Bartia uh, and, um, and her colleagues, and they're doing a, a, a wonderful job, very important, as I said, both for the engineering and the software engineering and the IT 
world, the technical world, but also, um, I think, for the people who are uh, doing ethics, because it's a way, it's a framework, it's a, it's a vehicle to bring ethics uh, to bear upon the, the very important world of technology. Now, the fact that design can carry uh, um, human values uh, and that design often is neutral, contains is the expression of our underlying ideas, is, is an old one. Um, this is the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem. Um, and it's called the Door of Humility because it's very low. As you see, you have to bow your head, and therefore the name of humility. If you go to the, the, the history behind it, it's nothing to do with humility. The door, it's pretty robust construction, is there to prevent, it was there, made there, because it prevented mounted horsemen to raid, to go on horseback into the, into the church and raid the church and take all the precious stuff out. So it's basically, it's a security uh, device. Uh, and um, uh, this is another good example that is the design for the ideal prison by the philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Uh, and he had this wonderful idea, a dome-shaped prison. I don't know whether there are any around here, but in the Netherlands there are a couple of them, and they were inspired by, by Bentham. So it's a very efficient design because you only need one person in the middle to oversee all the, the doors of the, of the prison cells. Um, and he makes uh, even a remark somewhere that you, uh, as long as the inmates believe that there is someone there, you don't need to have someone there, right? This could be even, even you could economize. But his idea is, and this is a quote from, morals reformed, health preserved, industry invigorated, etc., etc., economy seated, as it were, upon a rock, um, all by a simple idea in architecture. You see that design uh, is, uh, is informed by certain moral ideals. And we can have a discussion about whether these are the right ones. He also had a wonderful idea about um, personal, uh, personal um, uh, identification numbers that are tattooed in your arm, so for every uh, British citizen. So that, that's, he had some uh, ideas that, um, that perhaps uh, are slightly worrying. But Churchill said, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. Same idea. You know, this is, this, we, we express our ideas in our buildings and they start to influence us. The most important and influential uh, example of the fact that we express certain moral idea, ideas into design, into uh, our engineered environment is um, um, this example from New York, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, the low-hanging overpasses. It's described by Langdon Winner in a, an essay, Do Artifacts Have Politics? Um, and it's, um, and it, it's the, the following story. It's nothing to do with the truck uh, that's, that's over there. Um, th they are called uh, low-hanging overpasses. They were designed by uh, Robert Moses, a famous town planner and, and, uh, uh, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century. Um, and according to Winner, it's a slightly controversial story, but uh, according to Winner, uh, uh, Robert Moses was a, uh, a little bit of a racist, and he intentionally designed these low-hanging overpasses low so as to prevent the buses to be routed from the poor black neighborhoods to the white middle-class beaches. Uh, so if you stand underneath these things, you say, well, they're, they're low, uh, but yes, actually they are this low because they... Uh, they have this function. They, they serve as a, a barrier of segregation and of discrimination. So um, this is um, uh, another example. The formula that killed Wall Street, a very nice article in Wired magazine, um, that is, you know, this model of gauging the risks in mortgage portfolios found its way into the software and every financial planner in, in, uh, in New York was, uh, or across the, the country was advising people and gauging the risks in the money they handed out on the basis of this, and it turned out to be wrong. It, they, it turned out that they were looking through rosy colored spectacles to the risks and only found out later that, uh, that it didn't work. Uh, so uh, this model, this algorithm goes into the software and then starts to uh, shape and have its effect, shape the uh, actions of people and have an effect in the real world. 
This is an, uh, uh, an example from, um, from uh, France. So very good idea to have a real live audio video link on the helmet of uh, someone from the fire brigade because he, uh, he then can benefit from the medical advice of an expert uh, team, uh, stand by. Uh, and for, for once, this uh, IT project was done within budget, uh, according to the specifications and within the time, uh, but at the first test, it failed. And it's nothing to do with the smoke, it's nothing to do with a technical thing, it was a perfect thing. But it has to do with the values, because what went wrong is, is that, uh, you know, the medical people were shouting in the ear of the, the guy from the fire brigade that he had to apply a, a gel pack to the arm of the boy, whereas he said, no, for my professional responsibility, I have to, uh, there are five people in an adjacent building, and I have to help them and, and apply foam or water to them. So you see an interference between different uh, values or different responsible uh, uh, responsibilities as professional, and you have to address that issue first before you can make this work. This will never work, however perfect it is uh, implemented, if you do not address those values issues that are uh, lying underneath. So values are built into systems at, at, at every level, interfaces, infrastructures, algorithms, onto ontologies even, your coding, but also broader, the, the government arrangements and the regulation that, that pertain to them, authorization matrices, all are expressions of, could be expressions, sometimes trivial, sometimes very important. We don't know exactly in advance which will be which, but anyway, um, they are expressions of, uh, and they will, shaping, they will be shaping the world and they will be shaping and structuring the agency of people who work with them. So this is our key problem, I think, of value-sensitive design. This is the trick that we have to perform over and over and over again, whether we're designing an app or a system or a hospital uh, information system or whatever, there is a, a set of values, norms, laws, ideals, ethics, and principles, the ethical things in the world, the world needs to comply with these, and these are examples, privacy, accountability, agency, autonomy, sustainability, safety, and we can go on and on and on. And on the other hand, we have a world of engineering and technology and of course what we want is, is that those, the right hand world is an expression or an implement, uh, has implemented the things that we share, our values that we share and, 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 and think are very, very important and they get embedded and expressed and incorporated in computers and, and, and the internet and electricity grids and hospitals, what you have. And once we have sunk s hundreds of millions of dollars into the things on the right hand side, we want to be able to explain and justify and even audit that we have done a good job from the point of view of implementing those moral values. Um, so not only from the point of view of what engineers call the functional requirements, but we start to conceive of those moral, legal, social values as non-functional requirements which need to be implemented and expressed in the things that we uh, make. So this is something that we need to do over and over again. And towards the end, we will see how this applies to um, smart machines and to, uh, so you have a question. Yep. This is uh, a technical term in philosophy is this, this is a deontic world. All of the things that need to be, ought to be the case. And that's the world of engineering and material culture and the things that we design. And so PowerPoint is wonderful for drawing these kind of pictures, but there's a problem, a methodological problem, wherever you can point your finger, uh, because are these worlds really neatly separated? Uh, you know, is, uh, what is the status of those values, et cetera? And, and what does it mean to express and implement? All of these questions are highly relevant, but very difficult to answer. Now, what this also conjures up is, is that we need to bridge that. We have to start with privacy, accountability, these things that we all recognize, think are incredibly important, um, but we have to, let's say, bridge the gap to um, specifications or requirements with which engineers will be able to build something or design something. 
Uh, and so this is probably something, uh, along, something along those lines needs to happen. Or is, that is the decomposition or the operationalization of those values, high level abstract notions, and see how they can map onto uh, specific specifications for you know, the system needs to be or the technology needs to be that sturdy, that robust, that ha have to have that capacity. If you, for example, take democracy, um, so you start out with democracy as a, as a very general concept and you say, well, okay, what kind of democracy are we talking about? Is it deliberative, representative, contestatory, direct? Okay, what does deliberative democracy mean? Well, probably that you need to bring people together that, and that represent diverse perspectives and that will be able to talk to each other, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but if you want to salvage or um, support diversity, then probably you have to prevent people from you know, uh, engaging in groupthink and you have to expose them to a real kind of broad range of, of inputs. And so you would have to design for that. Right? So you see that you, you, will, you will be able to help yourself to fairly specific requirements for the systems or applications that you want to do. So one of the, the things that we need to, um, to do uh, time and again is design for X, where X ranges over moral values. So designing for privacy, designing for security, inclusion, safety, transparency, accountability, etc. Now, this is a list of values, and it's, 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 it's a long list, and we, uh, we think they're all very important. And that's because we have a kind of a pluralistic uh, worldview where we think that all of these things are very important and we could keep on adding to, to that list. And we find it difficult to compromise or to relativize one of these and say, well, you know, let's forget about equity. Let's forget about justice. Let's, let's forget about, let's just look at health or let's just look at safety or security. We want all of those things at the same time. Um, so there will always be conflicts and dilemmas between all these and trade-offs and we'll be looking at you know, worrying about how to do that. This will get us to our um, next uh, topic. Uh, this is an example from the Netherlands. Uh, this is a very sustainable bus, uh, but it exploded because it was too light and people forgot about their, the safety of the bus. So it was um, driving on biogas and it was very light, uh, but safety is also important. So if you optimize or op on one value parameter, it's not going to work. All of these things matter. So you have to somehow deal with the problem of value conflicts and uh, dilemmas. And uh, that's exactly the problem of overload. You, s you remember the whole list of values. They're all important and incredibly overburdened and overloaded uh, in order to assure or to see to it that all of those values get expressed and embodied and get some airtime. Um, so first I will talk about the, the problem of moral overload and then uh, about responsible innovation and what responsible innovation uh, can do for the problem of moral overload. So you've got the picture. Prosperity and sustainability, security and privacy, efficiency and safety, accountability and confidentiality. Another story from the Netherlands. Um, great innovation. We're going to smartify the electricity grid. We want to meet our CO2 reduction targets that Europe um, has put in place. And therefore, we uh, introduce in every household a smart meter, a little computer that uh, helps to, uh, to do some peak shaving and some load balancing and some, uh, uh, to reach some, some efficiency. And it's a no-brainer. People have studied this, and everyone was ready to roll. And then it was presented to the upper house. And some journalists started to talk about it. And then we had a big privacy debate because it turned out that this little device uh, sends information about every 15 minutes, information about electricity consumption in your household to your electricity company. And with some smart data mining, uh, they will be able to find out which movie you've been uh, watching on, uh, on the Friday evening. Uh, so um, down the drain with the, uh, with the smart meter was jettisoned, was rejected in the upper house in parliament. So a, f a very good, from a point of view of sustainability, a very good idea, but uh, it, it, uh, it, it was, a s it was uh, people pretended it was a smart meter, but it was not smart 
so as to anticipate and incorporate the privacy problems that people had with it. Uh, so they could have done a much better job and they could have designed a smarter meter if they would have incorporated these privacy considerations, used those privacy arguments that were, um, that were uh, raised later as requirements for the design of a smarter meter. The same story um, uh, with the electronic patient record systems, uh, nationwide system. Uh, 300 million of failed innovation. I've talked to those people myself who claim that they did a good job from a privacy point of view. Um, but same thing, rejected in the upper house because of privacy. They could have done a much better job if they uh, would have been able to uh, incorporate and express more adequately the privacy concerns. So this is the structure of the problem. We want our sustainability in the case of the electricity meters. Or we, and we want our privacy. Or we want our privacy and, for example, security in the streets. And think about the camera uh, debate, as big debate in Europe, probably less so than here, but you feel where the tension is. You have to reconcile the two, or you have to choose. Now, the structure of the problem of moral overload uh, is the following. You want your privacy above a certain threshold level, and you want your security in the street above a certain threshold level. But you're unfortunately, you're stuck with a first-generation camera system. That's a stupid camera system um, that gives you neither privacy nor security. It gives you razor-sharp images of innocent citizens, and it gives you blurred images of the crooks. Uh, so it's not very helpful. Um, or you have a second-generation camera system, which is much better, and you hang it everywhere. You have a lot of security, but no privacy. Or you decide not to hang it everywhere. You have a lot of... Uh, uh, privacy but no security. What you of course want, you want a third really smart camera system that gives you all the advantages that these systems can offer without the privacy drawbacks. And therefore the, sy the system and the technology needs to be very advanced so that it allows you to configure it in such a way that you can have the benefits without the drawbacks. Um, so there are various ways, perhaps in discussion we can now you can see this already coming that, um, and this is a, a, a highly, let's say, uh, this is the elaborate version. I have a short, shorter version as well. But this is the, I would say, the moral axiom of innovation. If a contingent state of the world at time T1 doesn't allow us to satisfy two or more of our moral values or moral obligations at the same time, but we can bring about change by innovation in the world at T1 that allows us to satisfy them all together at a later time, T2, then we have a moral obligation to innovate at T1. Or short, if you can change the world by innovation today so that you can satisfy more of your obligations tomorrow, you have a moral obligation to innovate today. Um, this is um, Ruth Barkin Marcus, logician, uh, and she has a principle in her logical system, deontic logic, that if, if you have an obligation to do both A and B, then we have, she says, a second order or higher order obligation to see to it that we can do both A and B. And that's just a version of what we've just said. Um, and, but this is a technical point. Ought uh, implies can doesn't apply here. It's a, it's a slightly weaker. There's no guarantee that we will be able to come up with such a smart solution that squares the circle that allows us to have our cake and eat it. But we have an obligation to try and see whether there are. Um, this is what I refer to as a meta-task responsibility, an obligation to see to it at, t, at time T1 that persons, yourselves or others, can do everything they ought to do at a later time. Right, so preparing for this lecture, I have to make sure that everything is in place, otherwise I won't be able to do what I ought to do, namely deliver my PowerPoint presentation. So it's a, it's a fairly simple, simple idea. Um, now something about this European perspective and how it is um, related to the value-sensitive design. Now Europe is going to spend in the next 10 years a lot of money on innovation and new technology. And uh, we're looking at, we're across the ocean, we're looking at each other Obama launches a robotics uh, scheme and, the, and Europe is thinking about should we do the same thing or are we going for quantum computing or, or what. And in Europe, we like to think that all our applied stuff, our research and development, 
and, uh, and, and innovation, uh, research related to innovation, um, is to do with responsibility for society and what we call the grand challenges. And there are two declarations that just returned from Rome. There is a, um, read a, published a declaration on responsible innovation. And it's, uh, it's, it stipulates that all of our money, and it's a lot, uh, should be geared towards the grand challenges. Yeah. It's climate change, it's, it's uh, uh, affordable health care for all. Um, so we, uh, we know what they are, and they resonate with the UN Millennium Goals. So our R&D program in Europe, it's called Horizon 2020, and there is 80 billion should do exactly that. And um, so we're moving from science and society in Europe to science for society. So science and research is uh, uh, for the sake of the problems that we have, the pressing and urgent problems that we have. So overcoming those conflicts of values and addressing the big problems of, of society are, can be solved by innovation. And it's, that's a form of, you could think of it as moral progress because in the dilemma, you're, and, and the examples I gave of the, uh, the yellow you know, squares, you're trying to move to a place where you can have your cake and eat it. You satisfy both privacy and sustainability, uh, security and, and privacy. Um, so what you're doing, you're moving to, from a situation where you could only satisfy one of your values to a sit situation where you can s satisfy two of your values. That is moral progress. You've expanded the set of obligations that you can satisfy. So that's interesting. So you're looking at the big problems of the world and you're doing and you're making moral progress in the sense that you can satisfy more of your obligations. And there are a number of very interesting examples. So after Snowden, the US lost 20 to 30 percent of its cloud market um, and uh, a lot of it is going to Europe. And a, a lot of the, the data that are stored where used to be stored in the US are now stored in Europe because Europe was big on uh, privacy enhancing technologies. What is the idea behind privacy respecting technologies is that we can use the functionality of, the, of, of IT but without the privacy drawbacks. And because Germany and Europe were quite strong on privacy, we have developed a, uh, an elaborate uh, set of techniques and technologies to deal with uh, privacy. It's not exclusive. I mean, it's, there are also a lot of work, or a lot of work is, doing, is being done here, that's clear. This is a nice example of how you can square the circle, how you can uh, eat your cake and have it. Uh, this is an IBM clip chip, an RFID chip, and um, it is attached to consumer products which you can buy in the, in the shop. And it follows you in the shop or slightly outside of the, of the, of the shop because it, it has a little antenna. But it has indentations so that you could tear off a part of the label and, therefore, and, and thereby shorten the range in which you can be tracked and traced. So it combines choice for the consumer. I want to be tracked and traced only within the department store, only at this uh, unit of the department store and not outside. I tear off a larger part of the label, uh, which prevents this, uh, you know, the, uh, the signal to be transmitted. Um, another good example of how you can do the right thing, the morally right thing, and at the same time benefit economically is, I think, uh, what happened in Germany with uh, sustainability technology. The rest of the world, you re probably remember, uh, was shaking its head in Germany. There you had the Green Party very strong on the protection of the environment. Uh, and everyone thought, how can they make economic progress? How can there be new jobs? How can there be economic growth? Uh, if, if the Green Party is chaining themselves to every factory they can, they can find. Uh, so there was this tension between economic growth and sustainability. Now Germany is market leader in the world uh, in sustainability technology and, and clean technology. If they would have downplayed one of those obligations, the environment and economic growth, say, oh, let's, let's forget about work, let's just worry about the environment, or let's forget about the environment, let's just think about economic uh, progress, then they would not have had the urge or the necessity to find this miraculous way out of this, innovate themselves out of that political uh, dilemma. Um, so, um, and I think that a lot of those zero visions, kind of 
do exactly that. They prompt you to innovate because they, they uh, prevent you from compromising or playing down one of your values. They say, well, this is really important. We have to do this. Um, a good example is Volvo cars. Very stringent uh, road safety policies and legislation and, and regulation in, um, in, uh, in Sweden. And uh, Volvo is known to be a very safe uh, type of car. Uh, so first, they started out making these cars very robust and sturdy, and it's very, very safe for the person who are driving the car, not so very safe for the people, the pedestrians and the people riding their bicycle. Uh, so they started to think and they started to notice that, and they started to uh, do sensor technology in order to warn drivers that there were pedestrians or uh, bicycles uh, nearby. And now they have realized that their crash dummies uh, were male. And they said, well, there are also pregnant women driving our cars, so we have to think about uh, a, you know, a different um, safety belt to accommodate uh, pregnant women. So you see that this is a moral kind of, this is of course an optimistic reading of what is happening in the Volvo <laughs> kind of research and development uh, unit. But it's, it's because you're morally concerned and you want to produce a good car, which is safe, but it also accommodates an, uh, a set of other values, and this is prompting towards innovations. And so it's not only a constraint that will keep you from um, doing business, it actually it opens up new markets, new opportunities, new possibilities. The Dutch Fairphone uh, satisfies a number of moral requirements. All of those moral requirements are condensed or consolidated in one design conflict-free materials, uh, an e-waste program, replaceable battery, worker welfare, etc. cetera. Uh, another um, proposal in the Netherlands for blue energy. So what are we doing? This is a storm surge barrier. It is also a device that manages our ecosystem, and at the same time, it generates energy, making use of tidal, uh, the tidal uh, differences. Um, so three things combined in one design. Three values, things that are very important. Or you could your data centers, we have a lot of glass houses, right? You put your data centers, give off a lot of heat next to the glass houses which need to be warmed up. Very efficient. Or this is our former pr prime minister uh, handed out an innovation prize to pretty much the same thing. Uh, our churches are no longer used for religious ceremonies, but for conferences, and they need to be heated, and they're very cold, especially the basements of their cellars are very cold. That's an ideal place to put your data centers because you get cooling and heating in one fell swoop. So values are drivers, can be drivers of innovation, moral progress by innovation, transforming the world by design so that we can respect more of our obligations and meet more responsibilities than before. Now we're coming to um, the final uh, part. I've got um, five more minutes or something like that, um, perhaps 10, um, if, if you can bear with me. Uh, so are these responsible innovations, what would that mean if we apply that to um, drones, smart machines, and robots? Um, well, we're talking about human responsibility. Uh, here and this is going to be one of the the big issues and I know that people are here also looking into the also the tech policy lab and I think for the right reasons this is going to be a huge concern uh, last week I was in Geneva before I was in Rome uh, and there was a meeting of the UN about uh, robotic autonomous robotic weapon systems and um, uh, one of the, the the terms that keeps popping up and that is going to make its way into the policy uh, arena also to the General Assembly of the United Nations is a term meaningful human control. And so um, if you ask the international uh, humanitarian lawyers or the people who are specialized in the Geneva Conventions or the laws of armed conflict, what meaningful human control means, they throw up their hands and they say, well, it's, it's yeah, something that we need, something to do with responsibility, but um, we still have to do a little bit of work on that. Well, towards the end, uh, I, I will have a proposal for what that could mean. Um, bear in mind that these systems, uh, these are not just devices or, or components of these. These are elaborate systems that you have to do. So it's a range of actors, a lot of human, peop uh, human beings in the loop, 
or, or on the loop or out of the loop, but anyways, in, involved or components, so that we call this socio-technical systems, and these things have to be designed. Right? Humans especially, this is what focus. Now, it is silly to assume that you will be able to design or that you're embarking upon elaborate, complex, highly dynamic systems involving robots or autonomous vehicles or autonomous technology with one crude, old-fashioned um, term like responsibility. You have to somehow come up and help yourself to a very sophisticated vocabulary to, um, to do what you want to do, is namely apportion and attribute and assign responsibilities to all of those components in that system. Right? Responsibility is also a design issue. Don't expect that you can embark upon something, you know, send a challenger to the moon or organize a very complex thing, uh, and, and then after, when something goes wrong, ask the question, who is responsible, and then get an answer. You, will, you won't be able to get an answer uh, only in a, in a very uh, contrived way. You say, okay, we'll make you responsible. But it's, um, that is, so it's, a, it's, responsibility is a design issue. So you have to, for example, decide who you want to respo hold responsible or make responsible, who will feel justifiably responsible, who can take responsible responsibility for what. Right? Uh, you have to distinguish between criteria for sound attribution of responsibility uh, and also the apportioning in those systems of responsibilities you will have to determine in which sense you're talking about responsibility. Is it, is it causality? Is it blame? Is it accountability, liability? Is it about roles or tasks? Right. And you can break them down even further. I'm not going to deal with that. One of the crucial and central questions that we will be confronted with in this whole um, area of, of smart machines, smart systems, uh, is something that is also referred to by Weizenbaum, discussed by Weizenbaum in this book I had earlier on, on, on the slides. And he quotes Admiral Moore about the Vietnam War. Um, uh, he says, it's unfortunate that we had to become slaves to those damned computers. He was referring to the situation where the systems um, um, represented raids over neutral Cambodia as uh, raids over Vietnam, and therefore they were they were okay, but they were not okay, of course. But they, they, um, so that's uh, that. That is. But he was he was relying. He was depending on what the system told him. So he was enslaved by. The, he was a slave of the system. Um, now this is the essential tension. The, the technology is wonderful. It's great. It helps us to do a lot of things. Also to carry out the things that we ought to do to discharge our responsibility. So there's a certain amount of empowerment going on. An agent A has a moral obligation to use the technology if that will help him to effectively apply his moral views on the world better than anything else. So a doctor needs to consult with a, an expert system if, if he thereby can do a better job in treating the patient. Then he has to use it. Right? And so that, that's, that's one horn of the dilemma. And the other one is the enslavement, because once he starts to use it, he becomes dependent in a certain way. And in, in which sense he becomes dependent, we will, I will try to un unpack in five minutes. Um, so I will just take you through a couple of those examples. Uh, this is the shooting of, the, uh, at the, of, an, of an Iranian uh, airplane uh, before the, um, the, uh, the war in Iraq already, uh, and 300 people lost their lives. And it was a... Um, you know, the, the people who gave the order to shoot the plane down were going by the systems and the information those systems gave to them. So this is the only thing they had to go by, right? And so they're in the belly of the ship and they're looking at their screens and they're, uh, they're acting upon what the system tells them to do. Same thing here, um, crash near Schiphol, 10 people dead. Uh, people were, the, the pilots were relying on their autopilot uh, but one of the altimeters was defect, and the, the throttle was connected to the defect um, altimeter. And so, it, uh, so it, the, the plane was thinking that it was already there on the ground, and it, it, uh, it went into retard mode, but, it's, um, but it, was already, it was 200 meters into the sky, so it dropped out of the sky. And, but the pilots were just going by the system 
and using the system. And there was no, this is a design issue, there was no signal uh, triggered by two in inconsistent readings of those altimeters. This is a design feature that would be really helpful, of course. Uh, Mount Erebus crash, same thing, 260 people killed. Uh, diff the, the, the ground personnel had entered the wrong waypoints, at least different waypoints from the ones that the, the, the pilots were assuming were, were entered into the system. And so this was a, a tourist flight uh, to Antarctica, and it crashed into the mountains in Mount er er Erebus because the pilots were, were thought they were um, flying the dotted line, but they were actually heading for the, uh, there was, it's poor visibility, uh, uh, but they were just, they crashed into the mountain because the system told them that they were uh, following the, the dotted line, but they were actually there where the red line is. So how could uh, they have told? It's very difficult. It's a very uh, elaborate investigation into this, in, into this case, and they were not accused. They were not blamed because the only thing they could do is follow the system and go by the system. So this is what Weizenbaum says, modern technological rationalizations in war have an even more insidious effect. Decision makers have abdicated their decision making responsibility to a technology that they do not understand. Responsibility altogether has evaporated. They cannot help but base their judgment on what the computer says. Um, now, this is the situation typically um, of narrow embeddedness this is where you are in your cockpit. You're locked in. The only thing that you, you, you can use is your, is your system. There is a limited freedom to start to believe something else than what the system tells you. And you are epistemically or qua knowledge, you're dependent on what the system tells you. Um, now, I'm not going to take you, time's running out, so I'm not take, taking you through all of this. But you have to believe me this. You know, you're there, the system contains all kinds of errors, you don't know exactly which ones, you cannot fix them, the system presents itself as a black box to you, uh, you have to decide, not deciding is not going to help you because it also qualifies as taking a decision. Uh, you cannot sit down, have a cup, cup of coffee and discuss with a colleague, um, so you're under great pressure. So that's your condition, you're there, you're narrowly embedded in that context. Um, the other thing is, is that you, your, your freedom to believe certain things is limited. If the system says that the pressure is 500, you will come to believe that the pressure is 500. If an air traffic control tower person uh, thinks that the flight from Paris is two minutes late, he will, he will clear the runway, or he, he won't. But he will act upon that system unless you know, there is an obvious malfunction and he has good reasons to believe uh, that, it's, uh, that the system is malfunctioning. So typically, user or operator belief states track the relevant system states. Um, then the third component in that, in that situation is epistemic dependence. So if Jones, this air traffic controller, believes that the system provides output P on good grounds, then Jones himself has good grounds to believe that P. But he cannot criticize the system. He lacks the competence, the expertise he needs to go by what the system tells him. So combine those three features of the cockpit. Narrowly embedded users or operators, they believe upon the evidence that the system presents to them, and they can only justify their beliefs in situ in that very situation by means of a principle of epistemic de dependence, which is this deference to the artificial authority. Now this leads to a situation which I've referred to as epistemic enslavement. Uh, which means, morally, practically, that non-compliance with the system's output constitutes the taking of a moral risk the user or operator cannot justify at the moment of his non-compliance. You know, if the, if, the, if the gasoline meter tells you at 10 kilometers above the Atlantic Ocean that there's no fuel there, you have to put it down in Reykjavik, or, because you cannot say just, uh, just overrule it or ignore it. Uh, there are 400 people there in the, in the plane. So then you're taking a risk that you cannot justify on the basis of the evidence that, that is presented to you. Um, the implications, well, or I'm coming back to this meta-task responsibility that I have introduced a little bit earlier. That is the user, the pilot, the person who's using that system has an obligation to check whether the cockpit or the system that he's working 
and that he, he needs to carry out his obligations and his responsibility has the right properties and is not preventing him from carrying out his responsibilities and his duties. That is at least what he needs to do. This is a simplified version and we can go into some more detail. But this implies for the designers and I, the design agents and everyone involved in the development of that system that if the user has that responsibility um, to check whether the, the system he will be working with allows him to do what he needs to do, then all the people working on the system need to accommodate the user, if they take the, the user serious, in doing exactly that. So they need to facilitate that type of investigation and quality assessment um, because otherwise it will be very difficult for the user and operator to you know, get a feeling for what the system can do for him. They, they have to allow him to take part and the designer has a responsibility to allow the user to ascertain whether he or she can meet obligations uh, by using that system. And of course, all the logic and all the moral assumptions that went into the design of the system need to be perspicuously represented to the user, otherwise he doesn't know what he's, what he's letting himself in for from a moral point of view. So I'm getting towards the end, but yeah, I, I'm, um, I've, I'm slightly overrunning my time. But um, so I'm, I'm coming back to this term that you will, that I think we will hear more about because of the, if alone, because the UN will put it uh, center stage, this is a meaningful human control. Um, and this only makes sense if we, if we have these things going, where, where users, people in autonomous vehicles, um, people working in drone systems, people working in highly advanced high-tech systems which exhibit certain levels of autonomy are restored to their place of autonomy and know what they're letting themselves in for in this high-tech autonomous, highly artificially intelligent environment. So what does it mean to have meaningful control in those situations? I think at least two things. These are not sufficient conditions, but necessary conditions. So this is signaling that some more work needs to be done. Um, but I think that someone has meaningful human control at least when he has taken ownership for the decisional mechanism by which he is taking his decisions and he is carrying out his work, his tasks, and his duties. Um, so he says, yes, I will work through this system and I will carry out my work and I will take responsibility for using this. It could be flipping a coin, it could be using this laptop, it could be using an app, it could be this or that. Someone has to explain to me what it involves, which logic, which algorithms are built into it, and then I will say, yes, this is what I take on board. Um, so take ownership of the decisional mechanism, the mechanism of practical reasoning, and that mechanism needs to be sensitive to his moral insights or reasonings in, in situ. If it's completely insensitive to, you know, if he's driving a, an autonomous car and he thinks it's better to swerve or to brake or to, or to overrule the system, then it needs to be able to respond under certain conditions to that. Otherwise, you could better leave, you know, leave him completely out or completely design out every degree of freedom. Um, so I think these two are very, um, these are candidate, um, candidate uh, kind of implications of the term meaningful human control. Humans need to be able to, um, in an informed way, to take ownership for the, the mechanisms through which they will be acting upon the world and by which they will be carrying out their responsibilities and their duties. Um, coming back, this is my final slide. So what designing for responsibility then applies very complex dynamical systems involving drones and cars and whatever on the right hand side uh, there. Um, so we need to complement that with an, 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 an equally uh, fine grained and elaborate scheme of what responsibility of responsibilities and not just work with one notion of responsibility um, and assign that and apportion that in those elaborate systems. Um, whether these are drones or autonomous vehicles or, or, or whatever, in order to prevent these kind of tragedies that we started out with. Uh, and um, so 
framing agents in a situation that have been, been designed by someone else and for which it's slightly unfair to, uh, to ask them to take responsibility. So um, with this, I would uh, like to close up. Um, I think they do. You know, we uh, if if we read up on the you know the privacy, the the, the social science that is, um, these these ideas do change. And and the the thing is also as a result of the technology that we introduce, and so people are becoming used to it, and they you know what we used to see as a problem no longer is is that much of a problem. Um, so that is uh, I I. I that we need to take some, some of that on board, absolutely. And um, although I have to say, if you look at the, you know, the standard argument is always that, you know, the younger generation is growing up, it's you, they're using Facebook, and um, well, they don't seem to bother. They have their own ways of work around these things. If someone puts up a, a picture that is not that, that great because you're, you're drunk at a party or something like that, and so you can't, can't get rid of it, what people will do is they will crowd it out and put all kinds of nice pictures around that so that uh, you still have the right uh, connotations. But it's, um, but you know, the younger generation will also have to come and see and apply for a job and uh, HR recruitment uh, people. And uh, then they may, may change their opinion and back to the importance of privacy, wh where they relax that for a couple of years. Uh, I'm certainly not a utilitarian, no. Um, but uh, that's that's a hard, um, that's something for in the foyer probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, but I, I'm. I'm. I, it's it's a good question, and I. I uh, we, we we need to sit down and talk about it. There are a couple of questions here and there. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Right. Um, I have a, a limited understanding of the situation because it's, but it, perhaps there are people uh, who have a better understanding of it. But my understanding of the situation was that they were um, flying above. They were, yeah. I, I may have may have um, given the wrong explanation. They were flying above uh, and um, doing all kinds of military actions above uh, Cambodia, um, and they were presented as. Um, actions carried out in Vietnam. So Vietnam was okay, but they were, they were not supposed to um, be engaged in hostile activities and armed conflict uh, about in, in Cambodia. And so the systems represented these things as being okay because they were in Vietnam, but they were actually not. So, so, so this, this is what he referred to as, you know, I, I, I believed I, I was going by what the systems were telling me, and therefore I thought it was okay. Now it turns out to be different. That, really yeah, that's that's a, I, 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 that's a good question. The, um, I, I said there is, there's more to tell about this because the same situation <coughs> uh, appears, uh, for example, in, you know, we have come up in the course of history with elaborate institutional arrangements to take care of that. So if I step into a plane, you know, I'm not going to check or the, the pilots are not, they're relying upon a whole elaborate system um, that they have confidence in and they trust the people who are running it. 
and so they defer to to that and it and we think that is okay they have they're fully justified in doing that if if i walk into a restaurant i'm not going to take little probes in the kitchen uh to see bacterial probes and see whether it's so I, i'm relying on the the food inspection the people who, who look after this and do their their regular checks and the same thing for the fda etc so so we have come in the course of history we have for these problems, if the stakes are high, we've come up with, with elaborate systems of quality assurance and, and checks. Uh, so it's not the pilot himself, although there are some, uh, he's supposed to, to do some superficial things if, if it's really, you know, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a piece of elect electricity wire hanging from the, the plane, then he should notice that, but it's apart from that. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're, you're, you're supposed to be vigilant. You're, I mean, you're a member of your professional organization. You, you're supposed to be reading up on the latest and, you know, the modifications of these and this, that, and the other. And so, I mean, you, you could be negligent in a, in a, in a weak sense if you, if you don't do that, right? And so that is, uh, um, yeah. Um, other questions? There's, there? Yep. Right. The extended um, mind, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's right, but I never knew what it meant. Um, I know that Mike is very similar to Matt, and I wanted to build on her. Uh, the first question was about, I wanted to build on her, her, her answering to your question, which is that it, it's supposed to be iterating towards some uh, pluralistic value system, mm -hmm. or accepting of the idea that if you won, you might not get the value that you want. Right. Um, I worry, I think, along with Matt, that values that we were leaning for would go away as if there's any left in the technology. So mm -hmm. privacy, we might say, is diachronic value that people re relearn when they get older. But mm -hmm. what about, for instance, the um, submarine? If you recall the famous example of you know, once upon a time in the laws of war, or the Norse war, I should say, uh, people would blow up a ship, and then they would rescue everybody that was in the water. Mm -hmm. Right? That was the norm. That, 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 it, it was quite above the norm at one level. Blowing each other up and then taking the risk, right? Mm -hmm. um, that became impossible when you introduced submarines because the point of submarines was to take one of the water and to try to, and you couldn't have another boat following the submarine and then know there was a submarine. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got around to a place for P2 or P8 where it would be feasible to rescue people again, that was no longer a norm. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't as though we suddenly discovered the ability to do something and reintroduce a strong, long lost value. Yeah. No, it, that's that's there, there's yeah. Some of the colleagues um, who are doing the, the ethics of technology talk about this co-shaping and this kind of you know th that's definitely that's that's an accurate description. That is actually going on. So I agree also with the first question, and so we somehow need to take that on board. But I think this framework, um, uh, for the first time, we discussed it just be before we uh, started. This framework of the of value-centered design or this approach gives that introduces that exactly that dynamic because for the first time in ethics as far as I can see uh, you get a, something of an empirical cycle going uh, because you start out with a certain conception of responsibility and you make it very precise you say well, okay let's implement that in, in, in these kind of systems let's let's design Google car systems or design drone systems in accordance with this particular conception of responsibility and then work with it and have experiences and see what people think and they say, oh, I, we don't like what we see. We need to go back to our initial conception and, and, and do a better job. Or perhaps we failed uh, under ways, but we, 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 we um, 
to the, the wrong operationalization of the concept or something like that. So for the first time, I think in, in, in history, in ethics, you get an empirical cycle. This is a notorious problem in ethics. What are your, what are your data points? What is your methodology? Um, so I think you know, in, in the past, we, we had something similar in institutional design. And you, you, would, you would start with, a, um, with parliamentary democracy or with a particular system, and you had to wait 200 years for the next revolution to occur in order to kind of redesign that system. And now you have very short cycles. You, you design an app or a system, have user experiences, go back to your initial moral or value assumption, and then make changes accordingly. So that is, that is I think, really exactly what we need. And, and, and it, I think it partly answers your, your question, because it's been a fast iteration, uh, and not in terms of just regular design, but in ethics. Basically, because that's the way we've now we've we've put it. Yep. So oh, sorry. 